everyone. I start the recording. Sure. So today we have the great pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Robin Thompson as a speaker in the seminar. Uh, so Robin is uh, from uh, Christ, uh, junior, junior Research Fellow from Christchurch uh, University of uh, Oxford. Right, and um, so he will talk about uh, epidemic modeling at different stages of uh, infectious disease outbreaks. Please. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much to, to Quentin, to Pierre, and to uh, all the organisers for this opportunity to come and give a talk. Um, like you just heard, so my name is Robin. I'm a junior research fellow at Christchurch, one of the colleges in Oxford. Um, as I was just saying to them a moment ago, I haven't been to Oxford for a little while because of the pandemic. Um, but I'm going to talk now about epidemic modelling at different stages of infectious disease outbreaks. So a small amount of the talk will be about uh, COVID-19, but um, it's, it's kind of a general talk about how epidemic modeling can be useful throughout outbreaks. And so the idea behind uh, my research um, is essentially to use epidemic modeling to answer important questions at different stages of an epidemic. So in the very initial stages of an outbreak, so in this kind of phase here, when case numbers are very low, I'm interested in answering questions like, are those initial cases going to lead on to a major epidemic with large numbers of cases? Or are those initial cases simply going to fade out without generating a major epidemic? And I'm going to come back to that um, a little bit later in the talk. I'm also interested in questions like which interventions can be introduced in order to reduce the risk of getting a major epidemic. And then in the middle phase of an outbreak, so when we know we've got a major epidemic, when case numbers are much higher, I'm interested in questions like how effective are current control measures and central to that is estimating the time dependent reproduction number and, and again I'll come back to that later in the talk. I'm also interested in questions like which interventions can be introduced so what control uh, strategies can be brought in in order to minimize case numbers or minimize numbers of deaths. And then towards the end of an outbreak or certainly in the sort of latter stages of an outbreak when case numbers have come down a little bit, I'm interested in questions like how should interventions be lifted? So, you know, are there any interventions that aren't playing a particularly large role in suppressing case numbers? And if so, can those interventions be removed safely? And similarly, um, when you haven't seen any cases, so suppose you haven't seen any cases for the last couple of weeks, I'm interested in questions like, is the epidemic over? So is the epidemic completely finished? Or might the epidemic still actually be persisting in individuals that simply aren't reporting disease. And so epidemiological modeling can be uh, very useful for addressing questions like that too. So I'm gonna focus on essentially two stages as uh, so the first of the, the first two stages of an epidemic um, in this talk. So for the first half of the talk, I'm going to talk about assessing the risk of a major epidemic, specifically looking at whether the initial cases, can we predict whether initial cases are going to develop into a major epidemic with large numbers of cases, or are they instead going to fade out as a minor outbreak? So I'll talk about that. I'll talk about um, an application to COVID-19 um, that I did back in January. Um, and so the question there was, we knew there were cases in China at the end of January, but the question was, uh, can we predict how likely it is that we see a major epidemic in other countries around the world? And I'll talk about how the underlying idea can be extended to more complex models. So, for example, to account for things like heterogeneity in reporting, um, things like age structure and things like time dependence. So if, for example, pathogen transmissibility is something that changes in time during the epidemic. And then uh, in the second half of the talk, I'm going to go on and talk about estimating changes in disease transmissibility. So, um, as I said a moment ago, central to that is estimating changes in the time dependent reproduction number. I'll talk about a framework that we developed actually last year uh, for doing that that's been used in countries worldwide during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'll then talk about how the basic framework can be extended again in a few different ways. And then at the end, I'll reflect very briefly um, on things that can be done going forwards. So um, to start then, so the very initial phase of an epidemic and uh, can we assess the risk that initial cases of disease will go on and generate a major epidemic with large numbers of cases? So the question is when a pathogen first arrives in a, in a host population, will the initial cases fade out or will they lead on to a major epidemic? And it's clear that either one of those two possibilities can happen. So. Um, this is the final size of historical Ebola outbreaks. Ebola survives in animal populations, it comes into humans every few years. So these are historical Ebola outbreaks up until 
the largest Ebola epidemic in history, the 2014 to 16 epidemic in West Africa. And what you can see is that when the Ebola virus enters human populations, it can take off and generate a large epidemic driven by sustained person-to-person -person transmission. That was what happened in the year 2000 in Uganda. This particular epidemic here had 451 cases. But in the same country, um, four years before that, so in 1996, there was an outbreak that had only two cases. And so you can see these sort of two qualitatively different types of outbreak, either major epidemics or minor outbreaks. And very basic um, epidemiological models can replicate that kind of behavior. So very basic stochastic epidemic models can generate these two qualitatively different outcomes. So if you simulate a stochastic SIR model, for example, that's what I've done here. I've just run one simulation of a stochastic SIR model. Then it might invade the population and you might see an outbreak that looks a little bit like the black line just there. So that's number of infected individuals as a function of time. If you do the same thing again, you might see something that looks qualitatively absolutely the same. So um, the blue line looks pretty similar to the black line. It's very slightly different. And that's obviously because it's a stochastic model. And so there's a slightly different sequence of events, um, but broadly absolutely the same type of outbreak. But if you do it one more time, so you run another simulation under absolutely identical conditions, you might instead see an outbreak that looks like this. So the first infected host has uh, been removed prior to infecting anyone else. And therefore, what you see when the pathogen is introduced into the system in the red case is you see a minor outbreak. And this matches the epidemic data I showed you a minute ago, where we have these two qualitatively different types of outbreak, either a major epidemic or a minor outbreak. And this leads on naturally then to the idea that there's some sort of epidemic risk. So when an imported case arrives in a new host population, there's some probability that what happens is that you get a major epidemic. And if you run your forecasting model lots of times, and then you always see something that looks like the red outbreak, then that means the epidemic risk is zero. That means that a major epidemic will definitely not occur. Whereas if you run your forecasting model lots of times, and instead what you always see is you always see something that looks like the, the blue and the black, well, that means the epidemic risk is one. That means that a major epidemic is definitely going to occur. And as indicated by the data that I showed you a moment ago, what's most realistic is that the epidemic risk is neither zero nor one. So instead the epidemic risk is somewhere in between. There's some probability between zero and one that an imported case sparks a major epidemic. And you can actually estimate the probability of a major epidemic, uh, starting with just a single infected individual for stochastic compartmental models. And you can do that by making a branching process approximation. Uh, so I'm gonna go on and show you how to do that then now in the case of a stochastic SIR model. Um, but this can be extended, as I'll come back to you later, this can be extended to compartmental models with additional complexity. And so in order to assess the risk of a major epidemic for the basic stochastic SIR model, what you do is you say, well, let's assume that we start with one infected host. We write down Q subscript I to mean the probability that you don't get a major epidemic starting from I infected hosts. And then Q subscript one is the probability of not getting a major epidemic starting from one infected host. And so the probability of a major epidemic, which is what we want, starting from a single introduction is then one minus Q1. That's the probability of a major epidemic starting from one infected host. So that's what we want to find. And if um, what we can do starting from one infected host is we can condition on the event that happens next. So if you have a single case, what happens next is either that case goes on and infects someone else in the stochastic SIR model, or that case um, is removed. So in other words, you can write down the probability of no major epidemic starting from one infected host as either they go on and infect someone else, and then there are two infected hosts, or they recover or, or are removed, and then there are no infected hosts. So then Q subscript zero, that's the probability of no major epidemic starting from no infected hosts. And if there are no infected hosts, then there definitely isn't gonna be a major epidemic. And so Q subscript zero is equal to one. And then Q subscript two, that's the probability of a major epidemic starting from two, uh, sorry, the probability of no major epidemic starting from two infected hosts. And this is where you can make a branching process approximation. So if you assume that those two infected hosts are independent, you assume that infection lineages from those hosts are independent, then in order for there not to be a major epidemic, what you need is you need no major epidemic from the first infected host. And you also need no major epidemic from the second infected host. And no major epidemic to be sparked from the first infected host has probability Q1. 
no major epidemic starting from the second infected host also has probability to uh, Q1. And so if those two hosts are independent, then the probability of no major epidemic starting from two infected hosts is then Q1 times by Q1 to make sure that you get no major epidemic from either host. And so you can substitute in Q2 is Q1 times Q1 or Q1 squared. And what you get is you get this expression here, you get this quadratic for Q1. In other words, a quadratic equation for the probability of not getting a major epidemic starting from just one infected host. And so this is something uh, that you can solve pretty straightforwardly. And if you do that, then uh, you get two solutions to the quadratic equation. I'm gonna focus on this one here. So this is one divided by the reproduction number of the pathogen. So that's the probability of no major epidemic starting from a single introduction. So then the epidemic risk, i.e. the probability of a major epidemic starting from a single introduction is then just one minus one over the reproduction number of the pathogen. And so that's how you can quantify with a very basic stochastic model, the probability of getting a major epidemic starting from a single introduction. Um, this has been the basis of a few different papers that I've written, extensions to that basic argument. Uh, one of them is this paper up here in the top left. This was published yesterday um, in Interface, in the Journal of the Royal Society Interface. And broadly what you see, uh, the, the overall pattern I suppose that you would expect is that the epidemic risk as a function of the transmissibility of your pathogen looks a bit like this. So if you have a very transmissible pathogen, then the epidemic risk is very high. If you have a pathogen that's not very transmissible, then the epidemic risk is of course much lower. So this is a kind of basic underlying modeling framework that I said, as I said, can be extended in lots of different directions. I wanted to apply this um, right back in January to the COVID-19 pandemic and to assessing the probability of getting, epidemic, uh, getting epidemics in countries outside of China. So this is when there were only cases actually that had occurred in China. And so the first I heard of, of the outbreak of this novel coronavirus was when I saw this um, notice in the top left. So I was actually visiting collaborators in Japan and I saw this notice in the top left, which says that there have been a number of cases of atypical pneumonia in the city of Wuhan in China. Um, and the thing that all of those cases have in common is travel to the Huanan seafood market, so this market in the bottom left. So that was something like January the 8th or January the 9th. It was just after I had arrived in Japan. And then of course, we all know what happens next. So what happens next is that case numbers or reported case numbers uh, began to grow such that about 10 days after I first saw this notice. So by the time we got to the 20th of January, there had been 291 reported cases. A couple of days later, it had grown substantially uh, so that by the 22nd of January, there were 446 reported cases. And then one day after that, so on the 23rd of January, that was when the first patient data were released. So line lists were released for approximately 70 patients, I think. Um, but it was very incomplete data. So um, those line lists were only complete for a very small number of those 70 patients. And so as I said, uh, what I wanted to figure out is, well, what is the risk of getting epidemics of this new virus outside of China? And so um, what that patient data had in it is it had various characteristics of patients that could be used along with the framework that I described a little bit earlier on in the talk to estimate the probability if the virus is taken to another country that there would then be a major epidemic in that other country following from that introduction. So one example of um, data that were available is uh, data describing the symptom onset times and hospitalization times of uh, individuals so of, of this small number of patients um, in China. And that's an important time period um, because the symptom onset to hospitalization period is a period in which individuals could be in theory out there in the community and transmitting the virus. And specifically what was there was interval sensor data. So um, what we know for this single patient here is that this single patient developed symptoms on the 10th of January. That's when they said they first experienced symptoms. And then they were then hospitalized on the 11th of January. And of course, we don't know exactly when on those two days, symptom onset and hospitalization actually occurred. And so that means that the symptom onset to hospitalization period for that specific patient lies somewhere in the range of zero to two days. In theory, they could have developed symptoms right at the end of the 10th of January and then be hospitalized right at the beginning of the 11th of January. Um, in other words, have a symptom onset to hospitalization period of roughly zero days. But it's equally possible that they, that individual was uh, developed symptoms right at the beginning of the 10th of January and then was hospitalized right at the end of the 11th of January 
So the symptom onset to hospitalization period could be as long as two days. So anyway, what we did is we took uh, this interval sensor data um, we then fitted the parameters of a branching process model using those interval sensor data. So, for example, uh, we estimated the rate at which symptomatic um, uh, uh, symptomatic individuals were hospitalized. And we did that using data augmentation, Markov chain Monte Carlo to data that looks like like this. So, in other words, symptom onset hospitalization period for one of the patients being naught to two days. We have similar data for, for um, a few more patients. So then we estimated the parameters of the model and then we use exactly the same framework that I referred to a bit earlier on to estimate the probability if the virus is introduced to another country, uh, the probability that what follows is a major epidemic in that other country driven by sustained person to person transmission. And the key output of this modeling approach isn't the precise value for the probability of a major epidemic. I think, you know, there was a huge amount of uncertainty about the epidemiological parameters um, at that stage of the epidemic. So the key output wasn't the exact value for the probability of getting a major epidemic, but rather it was this graph on the right hand side. Um, this graph on the right hand side essentially says, what can you do about it? What can you actually do to reduce the risk of getting a major epidemic? And the answer to that is, well, one of the things you can do is you can reduce the transmission period. So if you make sure that infectious individuals um, arriving in new locations are isolated quickly, then you can reduce the probability of a major epidemic from something relatively high down to something relatively small for each introduction of the virus to a new country. And so that was the main uh, output from this piece of work that, like I said, um, you know, we did right back in January. And so I think it was published right at the beginning of February. So really, really early on in the COVID-19 pandemic. Something else um, that I did in the same paper was I said, well, what happens if there's heterogeneity between different individuals in the population? So one example of that is that you could have some individuals that are, are simply inclined to be fast reporters. So if they develop symptoms, then they're going to report to hospital very quickly. And you might have some individuals that are slow reporters. So typically, if they develop symptoms, then they might um, report disease a lot more slowly. Of course, there are lots of different types of population heterogeneity that exists, but this was one of the types that I considered in this very early study. And so what I did was I fitted um, those distributions to the same data that I showed uh, you a bit earlier. So the data describing the symptom onset to hospitalization times for patients in Wuhan. And having done that, then you can actually calculate the risk that an introduction generates a major epidemic in a very similar way to before. So I, I can just describe how you do that. So this is one way to do that. There's actually another way to do it using probability generating functions, but I'm gonna uh, talk about a way that's analogous to the, the method that I described a little bit earlier on in the talk. What you can do is you can write down Q subscript IJ to mean the probability of no major epidemic, starting with I first rep fast reporters and J slow reporters. So in other words, um, because we now have two different types of individual in the population, we now have two different subscripts, whereas before we just had a, a single subscript. So QIJ is probably no major epidemic, starting from I fast reporters and J slow reporters. Then what you can do is you can write down, again, analogously to before, you can consider starting with a single infected host and you can condition on the next event. So if you start with a single fast reporter, then the next event could be that they go and infect another fast reporter, and then you've got two fast reporters and no slow reporters. Or the fast reporter could go on and infect a slow reporter. Then you've got one fast reporter and one slow reporter. And the other option is that the fast reporter can recover. Um, and then you've got no fast reporters and no slow reporters. And then you can write down an analogous equation starting from just one slow reporter. And then you can make the branching process approximation that we made earlier. So earlier we said that Q2 is Q1 squared. You do the analogous thing here. So you say Q20 is the probability of no major epidemic starting from two fast reporters. And so in order for there not to be a major epidemic, what you want is you want the first infected fast reporter to not spark a major epidemic. And you want the second infected fast reporter to also not spark a major epidemic. In other words, you want a probability of Q10 to happen for the first individual not to trigger a major epidemic. And you want an another Q10 to occur for the second individual not to trigger a major epidemic. So in other words, Q20 is Q10 times Q10. Um, 
So Q20 is Q10 squared. And then you can make similar approximations throughout. So Q11 is Q10 times by Q01 and so on. And you can substitute that in. And then what you've got is you've got two simultaneous equations with two unknowns, which we can then solve. Uh, you can actually solve it analytically in this case. And if you do that, you can again work out the epidemic risk whenever the virus is transported to a new location. And again, the sort of qualitative result is exactly the same as before. So the key thing isn't exactly what the epidemic risk is, but instead it's that if you can reduce the period for which infectious individuals are transmitting the virus in the community, if you can reduce that transmission period by isolating infectious hosts, then you can achieve a substantial reduction in the probability that imported cases uh, trigger major epidemics. And so um, you can then extend this in a number of other ways too, if you want to. So this particular slide is not um, specifically for COVID-19. Um, this, is, this is just a, a kind of general framework that we were working on actually before the COVID-19 pandemic. This is looking at the impact of age structure on the probability of a major epidemic. What you can do is you can basically do exactly the same thing. So you can consider lots of different age groups. You can say, well, how many contacts do individuals of different ages have? So this is a contact matrix for the UK. Um, I should have referenced it here, but this is for the, from the Prem et al paper in PLOS Computational Biology, I think in 2017. Um, and what this shows here is it says, well, how many contacts does someone of the age on the x-axis have with someone of the age on the y-axis? And the notable features here are that in general, uh, in general, individuals tend to have contacts with individuals of the same age. So the diagonal here is very gray, but also um, individuals that are young tend to have uh, contacts with individuals that are sort of in their thirties and, and forties. So in other words, um, parents have contacts with chil ch children, have contacts with parents. And similarly, parents have contacts with children. So there's another kind of gray streak just here in this contact matrix. And you can use exactly the same framework that I described earlier to say, well, if, an individual of a certain age transports the virus to a new location. So like I say, this isn't specifically for COVID-19, this is a, a kind of general framework. If, if the virus is transported by someone of a specific age, then what is the probability that a major epidemic follows? And so in order to do that, you write down Q, I, J, K, et cetera, for the probability of no major epidemic starting from I infected in age group one, from J infected in age group two, et cetera, and then you can write down equations exactly like we did before for the probability of not getting a major epidemic starting from a single infected individual in any one of those age groups. You can then condition on the next event uh, like before. You can then make the branching process approximation and what you obtain then is you obtain, uh, so if you have M different age groups, you obtain M simultaneous equations um, with M unknowns, where the unknowns are Q10000, Q01000, and so on, and Q00100, etc. Uh, so you can then solve those, that, that system of equations, and then what you obtain is you obtain output that looks like this output on the right hand side here. So this is the probability of a major epidemic as a function of the age of the initial case that brings the pathogen to a new location. Um, like I said, this isn't so. That, so in this particular figure here for the UK, the only thing that's different between individuals of different ages is the number of contacts that those ages have. So uh, if you wanted to apply this to COVID-19, and in fact, it's something that we are doing, one of my PhD students is doing at the moment, she's looking at saying, well, what happens if you have individuals with different susceptibility? So maybe children are less susceptible than adults. What impact does that have on the probability of a major epidemic when the index case is of a specific age? Um, so that's, that's kind of work in progress at the moment. So applying, tailoring this method to COVID-19. Something else that I've been very interested in is I'm working with uh, climate scientists in the US at Colorado State University to look at how epidemic risks are likely to change for host vector pathogens uh, going forwards under climate change. And so the broad idea of the framework is that you take climate forecasts, you then use those climate forecasts to make uh, sort of vector population forecast. So you look at uh, vector ecology and how that changes under a changing climate. You use that to estimate how vector populations are likely to change going forwards. And then obviously if vector populations increase, that means that there's a higher epidemic risk uh, for host vector pathogens. And if vector populations decrease and there's a, a lower um, epidemic risk 
for, uh, for host vector pathogens. And so we, as soon as you understand the changes in the vector populations, you can then look at changes in the epidemic risk using branching processes. Um, so this is all predicated on relationships uh, like this one here. So this is um, for Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Um, this is from lab-based experiments. And what it shows is it shows that there's a sort of uh, optimal temperature for Aedes aegypti mosquito survival. And so you can imagine that if temperatures change in specific locations such that the temperature is you know, close to 30 degrees, just below 30 degrees, then vector lifespans are likely to be longer. And if vector lifespans are longer, then that means that the epidemic risk is higher because you have more sort of vehicles for pathogen transmission. And each, each vehicle also, I suppose, also um, has a higher probability of transmitting the virus because they live for longer. Um, but anyway, you can, you can use the same branching process framework that I described earlier to say, well, what is the probability of no major epidemic starting from a single infected host at time t? So, that, so the example I'm describing now is if you just have a, stoch a stochastic SIR model in which the uh, infection rate parameter beta is a function of time. So that transmission rate is something that varies in time. And what you can say is the probability of no major epidemic starting from a single infected host at time t is you can condition on what happens in the next small unit of time and in the next small unit of time, that one infected host could infect someone else. So you've got two infected hosts or that one infected host could recover so that you have no infected hosts or nothing can happen at all, in which case you still just have one infected host. And then you can make the branching process approximation again. So you can say that Q2 is Q1 squared. Um, you can then rearrange this. You can take the limit of delta T going to zero. And then what you obtain is you obtain a differential equation describing um, the changes in the epidemic risk. And in simple cases, so for simple kind of forms of the infection rate parameter, you can solve that differential equation analytically for more complex forms. Um, you can't solve it analytically anymore, but you can solve it numerically. And then you can work out the probability of a major epidemic for an individual, uh, an infection introduced into the population at time t. So you can make epidemic risk projections going forward. Uh, something else we've been looking at recently is extending this then um, so in order to, to do this project that I've described at the bottom, what you need to do is you need to extend this basic underlying framework for host vector pathogens. Uh, so that's what we've done. So now we've got host vector models in which the parameters governing pathogen transmission are time dependent. And you can make a, a similar branching process argument in that case to project epidemic risks forward under a changing climate. Okay, so that's um, the first half of the talks. So that's um, all about assessing epidemic risks. And so the summary for, for this kind of half the talk is to say, well, stochastic compartmental models can be used to estimate epidemic risks, which are the probability that an imported case triggers a major epidemic as opposed to fading out as a minor outbreak. You can generate epidemic risks analytically. You can inform them using outbreak data. That's what I did back in January for COVID-19. And then you can adjust them in real time as an epidemic continues. And then you can extend these estimates to include um, a range of features in the underlying epidemiological model. Those features can include things like uh, different reporting rates between different hosts. It can include things like age structure in the model, and you can include things like uh, temporal heterogeneity. So now for the second, second kind of part of the talk, this, this part is just slightly shorter, I'm going to go on and talk about estimating changes in transmissibility during an outbreak, specifically looking at estimation of the time dependent reproduction number or RT. So this is some work um, that I did with collaborators from a number of different universities last year, um, including policymakers at WHO, um, also with some researchers at Imperial College London and other universities too. And so what we were interested in is assessing changes in disease transmissibility, in other words, estimating RT, the time dependent reproduction number, as an outbreak was ongoing. But not only did we develop an underlying epidemiological framework, uh, so a mathematical modeling framework, we also developed this uh, user-friendly online tool. So this online tool is hosted entirely for free and online. So someone can go on uh, and they can use this tool. They can upload their own data. So incidence data describing the numbers of cases per day that were observed. You can upload that data. And then what you can retrieve is you can retrieve uh, figures that look a bit like this one, describing changes in RT based on the incidence data that you upload. And so, um, I won't go into, into this in too much detail, but of course, uh, the two important quantities you need to know about are the, the time dependent reproduction number. So in other words, the number of cases of disease arising from an infected individual in the population at time t, and then also the serial interval. So um, a distribution describing the time 
between subsequent cases in the chain of transmission. So in other words, what this specific serial interval says is that if I contract, if I contract um, a virus or a pathogen and I show symptoms, then the probability that someone I infect shows symptoms one day later is about 0.22. The probability that they show symptoms two days later is about 0.35. The probability that someone that I infect shows symptoms three days later is about 0.2 and so on. So they're the two important quantities to know about. And then the idea behind the method is, well, you could, if you want to, if you knew both of those quantities, you could run simulations of, uh, of a sort of branch, uh, branching process, renewal equation model. Um, and what you would do is you would say, well, how many cases are going to appear on day T? You could say, well, we look at all the cases from the previous day, if you want to run a simulation and you would say, well, each one of these cases is gonna generate RT new cases on average. They're gonna generate RT new infections each. And the proportion of those RT new infections that appear on day T correspond to having a serial interval of one day. So in other words, a proportion 0.22 of those new infections will occur on day T. And then you can look back two days ago and you can say, well, there were this many cases two days ago. Each of those is likely to generate RT new infections and a probability in this case of 0.35 of those new infections are gonna appear in the data on day T. And then you can look at these cases from three days ago. Each of these cases is gonna generate RT new infections each. And then um, a proportion 0.2 of those new infections from those individuals will appear in the data on day T and so on. And so you can basically count back over all previous days and sum over those cases and then say, uh, calculate using the serial interval the expected number of cases that are likely to appear in the data on day t so, so that's how you calculate the expected number of cases on day t um, you can assume that they occur according to a poisson distribution if you want to to write down an expression for a probability mass function for the number of cases you expect to see in the data on day t and then once you've done that so of course what you actually see in reality is you see the numbers of cases on day t um, and what you want to work out is you want to work out um, a posterior distribution for the time pendant reproduction number given the number of cases on day T. And so in other words, you can write down a likelihood uh, and what that buys you then is it buys you a sort of probability distribution for RT based on the number of cases you've seen today on day T. And that's okay, but there's a slight problem with this. And the slight problem with this is that it, it bases, so it generates estimates of RT day to day that are very sensitive to randomness in the number of cases you see. So even if RT was constant, you would expect some fluctuations in the number of cases you see every day. And those fluctuations don't reflect, um, don't reflect the fact that RT is changing. Instead, those fluctuations simply reflect that there's randomness in the underlying contact structure. And so what you might instead want to do is not estimate RT every day using the numbers of cases from that specific day but you might instead want to consider a constant value of RT over some time window. Uh, so in other words, you can consider a time window of length tau days, use the data from all tau of those days, the numbers of cases that occurred on all tau of those days to estimate the time dependent reproduction number. And if you do that using this basic underlying framework, um, what you see is you see estimates that look a little bit like this. So you can take incidence data, you take an estimate of serial interval, you choose this tau value, so the length of the window over which you're estimating the time dependent reproduction number. And then what you obtain is you obtain output that looks like the output on the right. So in other words, you get an estimate for the time dependent reproduction number on this date here that depends on the number of cases you've seen that day, but also on the tau days previously. The estimate of the time dependent reproduction number that you generate on this day here depends on the number of cases on that day, but also from the tau days previously and so on. And so this, this kind of basic underlying uh, framework, like I said, has been used in countries worldwide during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, one of the things we did in our paper last year in epidemics is that we extended this basic underlying um, framework for estimating RT to include a number of new features. So one of those new features is that, you know, as I said a moment ago, you need to know what the serial interval is you need a serial interval distribution in order, order to use the method but you may not know what the serial interval distribution is so for example back in january we had no idea what the serial interval distribution was for covid19 and so one of the things that you can do in our tool is you can upload serial interval data um, so specifically household data describing 
the times that individuals displayed symptoms in known source recipient pairs. So for example, household data. And then what you can do is you can use those household data to then estimate the serial interval as part of this modeling framework. Another thing that we included in the method was the ability to differentiate between imported cases and local cases. And this is something that's been particularly important. And the reason that it's important is because if you have an imported case, that imported case can act as a source for new infections within your population, but that imported case is not a recipient of the pathogen within your population. And so if you didn't differentiate between local and imported cases, that would be a bad thing because you would overestimate the time dependent reproduction number, you would overestimate RT because you would be assuming that your imported cases are both sources and recipients of the pathogen. And that's not true. They're not recipients of the pathogen locally. And so, like I said, um, this new framework allows you to differentiate between imported and local cases in estimating RT. Here's just a quick example to show the implications of not differentiating between local and imported cases. This is for MERS uh, in Saudi Arabia. This was from um, the paper that we wrote last year. What you can see here is you can see two different lines. Um, the black line here is what happens if you don't differentiate between imported and local cases. And the red line here is the sort of more accurate estimate of RT, which occurs if you do differentiate between imported and local cases. So in other words, you, um, like I said a moment ago, you say that imported cases are not um, recipients of the virus in the local population. So you get out a lower estimate for the time dependent reproduction number. Okay, uh, what, one reason I should say actually that that's been particularly important, so differentiating between um, local and imported cases has been particularly important for COVID-19 is in island nations. So for example, last week, um, I received a letter from the government of Bermuda and the government of Bermuda have been using this tool to guide their decision making. And the reason that they've been using this tool is exactly because you can differentiate between local cases and imported cases and a very high proportion of cases that have been seen in Bermuda during the COVID-19 pandemic have been people that have brought the virus in from outside. So in other words, differentiating between local and imported cases is something that's been very important. Um, so to conclude this second half of the talk, parameter inference can be used to estimate reproduction numbers in real time during epidemics. Um, this approach has been used worldwide for COVID-19. Population heterogeneity is important though, so for example differentiating between local and, and imported cases is something that's important if you want to generate uh, accurate estimates of the time dependent reproduction number. I'm just going to do one final thing which I'm just going to flag up, I'm not going to talk about this at all, I'm just going to flag up this uh, paper down here. So this paper was the result of a workshop at the Isaac Newton Institute uh, back in May and what this does is it sets out some of the key modelling challenges for modelling COVID-19 exit strategies um, and there are a number of different challenges, they're split into three distinct groups. So one of the groups is about um, improving estimates of epidem epidemiological parameters. One of them is about understanding heterogeneities between individuals in populations. Um, and then a final thing is, is um, a challenge to use epidemic models in order to understand the data that are required for planning COVID-19 exit strategies with more precision. Uh, so I'm gonna stop there. I'm just gonna say thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity to give the talk. Thanks to the organizers and thanks to everyone for watching too. Thanks. All right, thank you, Robin, for a very interesting talk. I see you are precisely on time. Perfect. <laughs> so I think we have uh, we have time for uh, a few questions, maybe. Sure. So if, uh, someone is. Uh, some, does anyone have a question in the audience? Right. This is Jim York. Uh, Hi there. Hi. Jim. Hi. So my question is: Looking forward, what would you like to see remembered? What what how should we be affecting the next epidemic, the next pandemic? Yeah, that, I, think, I think that's a great question. I think um, well, it's also a very hard question because there are so many things that I think we can probably learn from <laughs> from our experience over, over the last well, sort of well, 10 months. Give if, us I some. Pick one, if I was going to pick one, um, yeah. that one thing would be um, related to the, the work that we did right back at the beginning um, of the pandemic. And that's to understand that when you have a novel pathogen, there's simply no way that you can know everything about it. There are so many uncertainties. And so I think one of the key things that, that should be learned, um, which I think a lot of epidemic modelers already understand, but possibly isn't understood more widely, is that the kinds of epidemic models that we used right back at the beginning of the pandemic were very good for making sort of qualitative conclusions and for demonstrating general underlying principles. 
what they obviously weren't very good for is for making very precise predictions. So in the example I showed, you know, we certainly couldn't have told you exactly what the epidemic risk was each time the virus went to a new country. What we could tell you instead, though, was, you know, something that could be done to reduce that epidemic risk, given all the uncertainty. Um, so I think understanding that better and being able to communicate that uncertainty to, to kind of non-modelers better in future pandemics would be something that, that's, you know, phenomenally important. Um, and it's important for how the models are used above everything else when it comes to policy making and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. Right. Thank you, Robin. Maybe uh, one one short question. Sure. There is. So maybe uh, I had a short question. Oh, maybe uh, Jacques has a question, and so we, we can talk about it later. Maybe uh, Jacques, I, I will allow you to talk now. Oh, Jack is me. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> no, I, I meant Jacques de Mongeau. Uh, he oh. the hand is raised. You can uh, you can talk now, uh, Jacques. Maybe I can uh, unmute you. I can't do that. Ah, yeah. Okay. Jacques, you can speak. No. Or maybe it's a mistake. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm quite friendly, Jack. So you can ask. You can ask anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jack. We cannot hear you. So probably with a mic or something. Yeah, probably. Yeah, pro probably we can uh, we can save this question for later because uh, we uh, now we have to pass to uh, the talk of uh, James York, and so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again, Robin, for a very interesting talk. Oh, cool, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks for the opportunity as well. Yeah. Right. So now, um, now Dennis, Hi, everybody. Yeah. Hi. On a um, screen share. Yeah. So in, in the um, title of the talk, there was another person that was supposed to, uh, to talk with you. So should I... Uh, should I uh, include her in the, in the presentation? Well, she wanted me to do the talking, so. Oh, all right, all right. Okay, so uh, our next speaker now is, um, um, is James 